Good evening. This is Sandra Voltero, and I'm your host for Be Prepared. And tonight, we are continuing our talk on food poisoning and uh, poisoning in general, of course. And tonight, we're going to talk about prevention and how we can protect ourselves and our families on this subject matter. So uh, tonight, my guests are back with me. We have uh, Wagas Buddha, who is the program coordinator for the Regional Center for Poison Control and Prevention here in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. And he's also responsible for education outreach for poison prevention in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. I'm glad you came back. Uh, Carrie, Carrie Sespotis. Did I say that right? Sespotis. Thank you. Okay, she is uh, the manager of the Community uh, Resilience and Preparedness at the Cambridge Public Health Department in Massachusetts. And she's also has worked with chemical cleanups and affected food storage. Mm -hmm. Welcome back. Thank you. And next to her is Marlene Johnson, who's our health agent here in Burlington at the Board of Health for the past 11 years. And she's previously has worked as a health inspector in Wuben and in Boston. Thank you for coming back, Marlene. Thank you. I know you all have busy schedules, so this is great. So let's start off with um, talking about, let's see, what can consumers do to protect themselves from foodborne illnesses? Well, when at home, it's important to wash your hands. Mm -hmm. It's also important to thoroughly cook food to the proper temperatures to kill any pathogens that might be on the food. And when we say pathogen, we're referring to bacteria, viruses, and parasites. They, uh, you, they can also um, chill, chill foods. Again, keeping the foods that require uh, temperature control under proper temperature, so in the refrigerator at 41 degrees Fahrenheit or below, and separate. So you wanna keep your raw foods separated from your ready-to-eat foods, clean cutting boards, clean knives, if you used it for cutting raw, <clears throat> raw meats, and then you need to use them to cut lettuce, suppose, for example. A separate vegetable board Absolutely. and a meat board. Absolutely, yes. Right. Or wash with hot soapy water in between. Or put it in a dishwasher, that help? A dishwasher would help. Yeah, definitely. Okay, good, okay. Um, Lucas, uh, can you share some poison prevention tips for parents of young children? Uh, sure. Uh, for parents of young children, it's important that first they try not to consume medication in front of their kids mm -hmm. because kids often imitate their parents. So if they see them taking medication, the younger they are, the more likely they are, it is that they're going to want to consume medication as well. And another common mistake that parents make is that um, in order to entice their children to have uh, medicine, they sometimes call it like, you know, candy. Like, you know, have this, it's good for you, uh, it's candy. So that's not a good idea, mm -hmm. especially because there's a lot of medication out there that's, like I said, brightly colored, and they're very similar to, let's say, candies and chocolate, for example. You'll have medication that looks similar to, let's say, M&Ms, for mm -hmm. example. So that's something that they should be wary about. And um, they should also, or like one, the, the main thing they can do is that they can keep their medication in hard to reach places, for example, on top of the fridge. Mm -hmm. And the, the next best thing is to store your medication <coughs> in locked cabinets. So they can invest in, uh, in uh, locks for their cabinets and that solves two problems. Like, you know, they can store their medication in there. They can also store household products inside the cabinet as well. Mm -hmm. So you are basically el eliminating potential sources of poisoning in kids. Mm -hmm. And it's also important that if they have um, visitors at the house or let's say the grandparents come to visit, so they should talk to their guests about securing their medication to ensure that their children are safe. Absolutely. And uh, one more thing they should do is that we've talked about potential poisonings due to medications and mm -hmm. uh, household cleaning products, for example. Um, something that's often neglected is toys because toys can present a choking hazard to kids. Mm -hmm. So what they can do is that they should invest in toys that, do, that are not broken down into multiple pieces. Mm -hmm. um, 
one thing that families can do is that they can go to a toy store and get a choke tube and that's basically a cylindrical tube and if a toy fits inside that then it's not safe for a child who's three years of age or below mm. and if they can't get access to a choke tube another alternative is that you take a piece of toilet roll uh, paper mm -hmm. and if the object fits inside that then it's harmful for a child who's three years of age or below two two years of older below awesome. three years of age three or years? below yeah okay well that's good information yeah uh, excellent wow um okay what is the role of food defense supplies as it relates to food safety and emergency preparedness so essentially food defense, um, it's protection of the food supply from intentional adulteration. Um, that type of adulteration is usually intended to cause harm to public health or to cause economic disruption. Um, so it could be um, domestic or international <coughs> terrorism, it could be a disgruntled employee, um, it could be um, uh, someone tampering for personal or political gain um, and essentially, um, uh, communities um, like in, in Cambridge, um, other local communities in Massachusetts, um, should be mindful of um, food defense and emergency preparedness planning. And what I mean by that is it's important to conduct what's called the vulnerability assessment. Um, you ask questions and, and, and you look at your plans and policies um, and procedures um, to get a sense of where there are weaknesses. So I can give an example. Um, uh, Cuyahoga County um, Public Health Department, um, which is in Ohio, it's actually the area where Cleveland is, mm -hmm. um, they had received funding from the FDA to do this type of vulnerability assessment. And what they did with that um, was they conducted what they called imposter inspections. So essentially, um, they had actors um, that were hired um, to pose as health inspectors. Um, they went to local grocery stores, local restaurants, um, and um, gained access um, to these facilities. Um, and they did, um, the health department did plan this out with, with fire, police, um, hazmat ahead of time so that everyone was aware and on the same page. The only folks who weren't aware were the actual licensees or the food establishments. Mm. Um, so after the fact, um, there was a debrief um, and what they found is that um, food establishments weren't likely to challenge um, new inspectors um, to see ID, um, to ask them about um, you know, their qualifications to even accompany them on food inspections. Um, and there were actually recordings that were taken um, during these imposter inspections. And in watching those, you can see that it's, um, you know, there's lots of opportunities for people to gain access to the food okay. supply. So that's something to be mindful of. Um, that's scary. So one of the things we want to do in our local communities is educate our licensees, our, our restaurants, our large grocery stores and food establishments on asking for credentials if they see an unfamiliar inspector, um, accompanying inspectors on inspections um, so that they um, can keep track of what's happening during the inspection. And um, the FDA actually has a set of resources for um, adopting food defense in emergency preparedness planning. Um, they call their resources Free B, and it's essentially a set of eight scenarios for planning um, to test um, for local jurisdictions to test and modify their own plans. Um, there are scenarios that include regulatory traceback. Um, investigating illness clusters. Um, there's even a scenario that's uh, contamination of raw meat at a processor from chemical adulteration. Um, so that's available on the FDA website. And FDA also has a food defense plan builder um, that can be used to assist local communities in developing and testing their plans. I'd like to, okay. I'd like to add something sure. if I may. Um, Carrie makes a really good point. In fact, when I do my pre-operation inspections for all the new businesses in town. That is something that I talk to them about, is that you've met me, I did the inspection today, and we have other health inspectors that come in and always ask for ID. I tell them, you can tell somebody to leave. If they don't have the proper ID, tell them to leave. We even go as far as to put their photo on our web page, so they can actually look on our web page to see the, the picture of the inspector. and. Um, 
vulnerability, salad bars. Mm -hmm. um, we, we make sure that there's somebody always monitoring the salad bar and watching for suspicious people. Mm -hmm. If somebody's lingering too long or it looks yeah. like they're pulling something out of their pocket. Mm, um, yes. One thing that I find, they don't keep their, their back doors locked. Mm -hmm. And that's something yep. that we mentioned too, to oh. always lock their back doors. Or they back doors. Right. right. Exactly. Yep. I can see they want the fresh air in the mm -hmm. kitchen is too hot or mm -hmm. something. Exactly. Scary. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Okay. Let me think here. So what can consumers do to protect themselves from poor bone illnesses? Is there anything in particular that we can do? Well, I would suggest just uh, when lo looking at menus, if you're going to order um, eggs, we know that eggs can cause foodborne illness if they're not fully cooked. Mm -hmm. So if you are part of the vulnerable population, uh, highly susceptible population being uh, the very young, the elderly, pregnant women, and anybody with a weakened immune system, they should think twice before ordering a sunny side egg or mm. an overlight egg mm. or a rare or medium rare burger. Mm. And the menus now will dictate or show you if something is made undercooked, if there's salmon or uh, tuna or steak tata. Mm. Usually you'll see on the menu that these are items that are either undercooked or served raw. Right. And pe people who are susceptible should think twice before ordering them. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And um, I just wanted to add, um, many of these establishments, they have inspection stickers, so maybe consumers might want to look for how recent is the inspection sticker, the certificate at these establishments? Some food establishments use that or they, they will put a letter grade. Yeah. In Burlington, our reports are public information and any citizen who wants to see inspection reports can contact our office and we will, be, will gladly share that information with them. Um, at present, we don't have stickers or letters um, that we use in our restaurants. Okay. Where would you I'd put them though for people to they, see? They usually go in the door or the window of the establishment. I know oh. New York City does that. I think Newton, um, Massachusetts does that. Some of the other towns and cities are looking into doing that. So I just want to add that it, it does vary by local jurisdiction. Um, so the food code in Massachusetts is enforced at the local level. So um, each local health department might have a different procedure for that. Um, in Cambridge, we have an open data portal, so all the results of our restaurant inspections are available in the open data portal, um, which even has a software development kit, so it, it gives developers an opportunity to create apps that consumers can use. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is um, it's important for consumers to be aware that not all um, causes of foodborne illness um, can be prevented by cooking. Um, so uh, chemical toxins, for example, are, are not um, destroyed by the cooking um, step. And um, there Such are- Such as what? What, what chemicals? So um, uh, it could be heavy metals. Um, for example, um, uh, selenium, that um, can be a uh, food additive. That's not something that's destroyed um, in the cooking process. Um, any of the natural toxins that occur in uh, seafood or um, from uh, shellfish, things like that, um, would not be destroyed in the cooking process. Um, uh, fungal toxins um, uh, potentially could survive. There's certain types of bacteria that produce um, toxins mm -hmm. uh, that can pr um, survive the cooking step. And also there's certain um, types of foodborne illness um, where, uh, for example, listeria, where the bacteria can survive at low temperatures. Mm. Um, so uh, uh, keeping things in the freezer or the refrigerator may not necessarily be a preventative step if it's something that's served ready to eat, like um, deli meat or um, dairy. So it's just important for consumers to be aware um, and for people to ask questions about how food has been handled, how it's been stored, how it's been prepared. Mm -hmm. What do we do? I mean, there are restaurants I see that people wear one glove and pick up the food with the hand that doesn't have the glove. <laughs> I mean, I, when I see it, I speak up and say, "Good for you. You shouldn't be handling that food." You should speak up because that's clearly a food code violation. The food code states that there is to be no bare hand contact with ready-to-eat food. 
So the use of a utensil, a deli tissue, um, a glove would make sense. You have to remind me, I'll tell you where I was. It was in Burlington, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> okay, um, let me see, Vargas, uh, can you s discuss some medication safety tips for us? Sure. Um, with regards to with regards to seniors, I would say I've oh. lost my mic over here. We all do it. <laughs> there we go. Uh, just to say. We can oh, that's better. All right. With regards to medications for seniors, um, <clears throat> I would advise them to discuss with their doctor. You know what are the potential side effects of medication they're taking. Mm -hmm. Right. They should also talk to their healthcare provider as to what they should avoid while taking medications because, for example, certain common substances can interact with medications. Um, some seniors, they might take, for example, herbal supplements and they can interact with medications as well. Mm -hmm. So just to give you a few examples, um, <coughs> excuse me, let's say somebody is on a blood thinner. Mm -hmm. and they take aspirin. So that could interact with the blood thinner and it could cause excessive bruising mm -hmm. or abnormal bleeding, for example. Right. So if somebody's on, let's say, cholesterol medication, right, and they take something like grapefruit juice, mm. right, if you're on cholesterol medication and you take grapefruit juice, so it can cause complications. Mm. For example, <coughs> the drug stays in your system for a longer period of time and you can have weak bones long term. Wow. So these exam this was just to give you an example that even like you know common items can interact with medications. So it's important to talk to your healthcare provider as to what you should avoid while taking a specific yeah. drug. And uh, <coughs> it's also important for people to be mindful of the active ingredient in the drug mm -hmm. that they are taking. Nowadays, people have access to over-the-counter drugs that they do not need to consult their healthcare provider. Mm -hmm. Like they often don't consult their healthcare provider. So, um, analgesics, like you know, uh, acetaminophen is a very co the most common ingredient in painkillers. Mm -hmm. Let's say somebody's given a prescription drug, right, for uh, which has acetaminophen, and they go and they take an over-the-counter drug, mm -hmm. which might also have acetaminophen in it as well. So too much of an active ingredient can cause problems, sure. right? In the case of acetaminophen, um, which is common in almost every household, you can have liver damage, for example. Right. So you know, these are some things that people should be wary about. Um, okay. If people get their health information online, for example, um, they should go and make sure that they get their information from websites that end with .gov or .edu or .org because they are reputable websites. Okay. Yeah. Um, and if they have to get information from online, make sure that the information is not more than a year old. That's a, right? good, that's a good point. And um, what else can seniors do? Um, I would advise seniors to maintain a medical journal uh, and list out all the drugs that they are taking. This is useful because it enables proper communication with your healthcare provider. Mm -hmm. Your healthcare provider knows what medication you're taking and reduces any chance of errors, okay. for example. That's very good. And uh, people should also invest in pill boxes so that they can store their medications and they know exactly what they're supposed to take. And um, they should be labeled. Exactly. Each little compartment. Exactly. It is. Um, there are various types of pill boxes. Some of them even have, like, you know, compartments for the morning, right. evening, or night. Right. So people should look at s as to what's convenient for them, but they're, they're good tools. And um, we've come across many seniors, what they do is that, um, let's say they've missed a dose of a medication, right? So they double the dose the next time. So yeah. they should talk to their healthcare providers whether they can do that with their med with the medication they're taking. Yeah, absolutely. So it can because it can be harmful for certain medications. I did talk to a pharmacist that we have here on the Burlington Volunteer Reserve Corps. I have that clip. Can we see that? I'm here today with Min Tu, uh, who's a pharmacist with uh, the Burlington Volunteer Reserve Corps, 
and she currently works at the Boston Medical Center in Boston. Uh, hello, Min. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, today we're doing a show on uh, poison prevention and food safety. Uh, could you tell us uh, where the pharmacists are with the situation around poison? Um, when it comes to medications, the pharmacists are the ones who clinically analyze for every med medication that's dispensed to a patient of uh, the therapeutics effects, um, drug interactions, uh, and to prevent any medication errors that may occur with a patient. So one of the take home points I do suggest is every patient that comes in to fill their prescriptions, please have a personal medication records. That is not just only disclosing what the medications you're taking that's prescribed to you, but also you know over the counter medications, herbal supplements, vitamins, or any other substance that you might take. So that's all will come into play for a, a pharmacist to clinically analyze to see if there's things appropriate or whatnot. And that will you know, go a long way to help prevent any poison. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a lot of good information, um, Min, and I'm sure that uh, people are being a little bit more concerned about the mm -hmm. situation, so I'm sure they'll uh, take notice of whatever you have to say about this subject. Yes. I think we are concerned also about children in, in getting into their medicine, so just a last remark as to uh, how you would like them to handle yeah. that. So keep all medications out of reach of children, use safety caps, um, keep them out of sight, and also communicate saying, hey, this is grandma's medications, you know, don't go near it, don't open it. You know, strong communication comes a long way. Okay, thank you so much, for Min, for being here today. <laughs> thank you, happy holidays. <laughs> all right. Um, Can I just add something to that? Sure. Thing? Um, she was talking about child resistant mm -hmm. caps, for example. Mm -hmm. So just because something is has a child resistant cap doesn't necessarily mean that it's child proof. Well, that's true. A lot of parents, like, you know, when they see child resistant, they take it easy. That's not the case. Mm -hmm. There have been experiments. They've done experiments in preschools where they've given child resistant caps to kids mm -hmm. to see if they could open them, and many of them could. Yes. So that's something that people it's should keep so in mind as well. It's so true. Kids today are very smart. They, they manage to figure out how to do those things. Sure. Carrie, I want to ask you one more question. Sure. What is the risk assessment process as it relates to human exposure to potential chemical contaminants? Sure. So risk assessment is a tool that toxicologists use, and it's used to assess um, when there's exposure to a substance, the likelihood that harm could result to human health. Um, so, for example, not all, um, I should back up a minute, in, in order for there to be risk, there has to be both an exposure and a hazard. Um, so something may be a hazard, but someone may not be exposed to it. For example, if we had a bottle of bleach sitting on the table here, it's not a hazard to anybody because nobody's ingesting it, nobody's inhaling the vapors. Mm -hmm. So that's something to be mindful of and something that toxicologists consider. Um, and in terms of, um, the methodology, um, there's, there's a step where you identify the hazard. Mm -hmm. So what are we talking about? Is it a chemical um, contaminant? Um, is it something biological? Um, it could even be radiological. And then we talk about a dose response assessment. So that is how much um, and how often um, does a person need to be exposed and the how often piece is part of the exposure assessment um, to result in harm. Um, and, and the final um, part of the methodology is a risk characterization. Mm -hmm. So essentially what a toxicologist would do would be to develop scenarios. A number of those scenarios would involve uh, the most susceptible people of the population. So that would be children and elders. Mm -hmm. um, if it's an exposure at home, you would assume that that person is exposed 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So right. um, using very conservative assumptions. Um, and the outcome of the risk assessment methodology is really a probability or a likelihood of harm. Mm -hmm. um, and usually with chemical contaminants, um, toxicologists will consider um, health endpoints um, ranging from cancer effects, if it's a carcinogen, uh, to non-cancer endpoints, which could be things like liver disease or heart disease or kidney impacts or neurological. Yeah. Um, so th that's, that's some of the thinking that goes into characterizing um, the hazards and uh, the risk from exposure to those okay. hazards. There's so much good information here, and I wish we had time to really cover more 
I was going to ask, like, when you want to make a last comment on how soon should someone call if they think they've been poisoned? Well, contact the Board of Health, the local Board of Health in the town or city in which they ate at a restaurant so an investigation can be done. Okay. So that's important. Okay, good. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here, my guests. I really appreciate it. Marlene, Carrie, and Wagagas. Uh, we are be prepared, and this show will be showing in December and in January. And so thank you very much for joining us, and have a good evening. Mm -hmm. and there's so much more information I am sure you would have wanted to say.